Good evening. I know that we want to be praying for uh, the people in Rogers and in that area. And I don't myself know the extent of the damage, tornado damage that was done up there last night. Um, <clears throat> I know that they were hit pretty hard and there have been some fatalities. Um, <clears throat> Brenda Henson texted me this morning and asked how uh, Caleb and Brianna were because they live in Rogers. I wasn't aware of anything that had happened but have since found out about the bad weather destruction that took place up there so I know they're on your minds and hope that you'll keep them in your prayers. And I don't know what, if anything, we can do to help, but uh, I hope that somehow we can pray as well as help the people up there. I'm pulling a switcheroo tonight. I'm not doing what I had intended tonight to do. I wasn't really comfortable with the subject that I'd selected for tonight. Uh, I was willing to go with it, but just something in the back of my mind just not settled with regard to what I had intended to do. I may do it some other time. I may need to do it next week. I'll need something next week, so I may need to just develop it a little bit more. So in the, in the spirit of Orson Welles, I will preach no sermon before it's time. So that one will have to wait a little while so I can work on it some more. Dale Morris, this morning, in his prayer, said something that made me think a little bit, and maybe it did you too. And because of what he said, I've decided to go this direction tonight with regard to sacrifice. Because in his prayer this morning, he mentioned Memorial Day tomorrow and what that day means in terms of those of the military in years past who paid the ultimate sacrifice and he mentioned sacrifice uh, more than once and it, it made me think a little bit about sacrifice and how much we sacrifice if we sacrifice at all and <clears throat> so um, connected with Chris to let him know that I'm throwing a change up tonight. And Linda, to let her know, because uh, uh, when I give her the sermon subjects, she puts them on the PowerPoint, and there they are. And sometimes, not too often anymore, but once in a while, I change my mind. So here we go, tonight. I'm going to think about sacrifice just a little bit. In part, because of tomorrow and what tomorrow means. Memorial Day. Whenever I think of Memorial Day, I remember a, a book that I have at home. In fact, I have two, volumes one and two, that deal with the history of Southern Illinois, where I'm from. And in that, in one of those volumes, it speaks of Memorial Day, how that there was a gathering in 1866 at a cemetery in my hometown of Carbondale, Illinois, and I know where that cemetery is. I've walked through it a number of times when I was a kid, but they had a gathering there, General John A. Logan, was the speaker, keynote speaker at that time, and people came from everywhere. 
and they placed flowers on the graves of the Civil War soldiers that were buried there and still are. And the article, or the, um, yeah, it's an article actually, uh, kind of interesting because the author uh, described how John A. Logan spoke, General Logan, and people came, they had a barbecue and all of that, and a fight broke out. And I thought, well, <laughs> it's just like people. People are people everywhere you go. And <clears throat> so a fight broke out. Well, that, that's the way to celebrate Memorial Day, I guess, huh? But anyway, those who cause us to reflect on days like tomorrow are those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And I want us to think about sacrifice for just a little bit. Do I sacrifice in my life? Have I sacrificed in my life? Do you sacrifice? What does sacrifice mean to you? Would you give something up? Would you call that a sacrifice? I remember some years ago, and this has been, I don't know, a long time ago, I guess. I was driving around Little Rock, was listening to a morning show on B98.5, and they had quite an interesting morning show at that time. This has been 20 years ago or more, I guess. But on that particular show, they um, were concentrating on a, a certain thought. And that thought was phrased in these words, basically. In these hard economic times, what would you not be willing to give up? Now, uh, I thought about that some. In these hard economic times, 20 years ago, maybe 25, I'm not sure, hard economic times? Were we having hard economic times? I know some people do. But I thought it a little bit funny that they were discussing hard economic times uh, I know some people who have lived through some hard economic times. I think my parents did. My parents, both my mom and dad, were born in 1918. Both have long since passed away. But they grew up in the 1920s, 1930s. They were among those who grew up during the Depression years. And I, ha I have to think, well, they knew something about lean times that I don't know. I never experienced anything like that because I'm a child of the 50s and the 60s. And relatively speaking, we had it pretty, go pretty good. I mean, Dad, my dad worked a regular job from 8 to 4 or whatever it was. Mom stayed at home. She wore a dress every day. She took care of and raised us kids. They were the typical mom and pop of that time period. And they raised kids that were pretty typical as well of that period of time. We didn't know what hard, hard times were. Dad was the only, dad was the breadwinner. And we didn't have a lot. But we didn't know it. And if I wanted something, and mom and dad didn't have the money to buy it, my dad would often say, well, it doesn't hurt you to want, does it? And so I, no, it doesn't hurt me to want. So that just meant you're not going to get it. So uh, that was all right. We lived to tell about it. But in these hard economic times, 
What would you not be willing to give up? And as I listened to that program, and people were calling in, giving answers, I thought it was kind of interesting because what I heard, and I jotted some of these down, people called in and here were some of the things they said that they would not be willing to give up. In other words, sacrifice. If you're wondering, where's the sacrifice here? Well, all right. These are things they were not willing to sacrifice. Happy hour. <laughs> Cell phones. Starbucks. Netflix. Manicures, pedicures. Internet. HD TV. Those are things that those callers were not willing to sacrifice. Now, if the parent, if the question were to come to you, how would you reply? What would you not be willing to sacrifice? Give up? I have an idea that probably the responses would not fall within the category of the ones that I just mentioned to you. Maybe they'd be a little uh, higher up than that, I would hope anyway. I wonder if the current generation really knows anything about sacrifice. Because I use my own parents as an example. And I have an idea that your parents could supply another example, perhaps even greater than my own, of people who knew something about sacrifice, who understood what it was to do without, to not have what you needed, maybe, to understand hardship, deprivation, and to grow up in such times and live to be happy. What if we really had to sacrifice something? Give it up. Do without it. What if we really had to do that? Would we? Financial sacrifice? That's one thing. It's not the most important thing. That's one thing. But there are other types of sacrifice that are far more important than that. In my dictionary at home, when I say dictionary, I'm talking about my Bible dictionary, which covers both Old and New Testaments. I looked up the word sacrifice. And it gives you its amounts, expository dictionary, uh, of the Bible. It gives you Old Testament, New Testament, verbs, nouns, adjectives, all of that. And very easily, just turn to the word sacrifice, so it gives you the Old Testament usage of it. And Mounts' dictionary indicated that in the Old Testament, the word sacrifice is used 134 times as a verb. As a noun, it appears 162 times in the Old Testament. The majority, if not all of those times in the Old Testament, it has to do with the slaughtering of animals, sheep, goats, what have you, for animal sacrifice under the Old Testament mosaic system. Okay? Then I move over to the New Testament. The New Testament is not used nearly as often. Uh, the verb is used 14 times. The noun, 29 times. And in like manner to the Old Testament, a great many times it has to do with animal sacrifices and such as that. And when they came out of that old system into New Testament Christianity and those things were no longer a part of their religion, those things being given up. I want us to think a little bit about sacrifice in the New Testament. 
Because tomorrow is a day that reflects on sacrifice. But I'd like for us to reflect on sacrifice today. On a certain kind of sacrifice that means something. And I'm not saying that the sacrifice that we'll think about tomorrow that people gave doesn't mean something. It does. It means your freedom. It means that you're here because of what they did. But in terms of our eternal welfare, there's a different kind of sacrifice that I want us to ponder for a little bit tonight. Because fundamental to New Testament Christianity is sacrifice, as you well know. Were it not for the fact that in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave, sacrificed his only begotten son, that whosoever should call upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. Were it not for that sacrifice, we wouldn't be here. So the fact that God so loved that he gave speaks to me of sacrifice. I'm glad that God sacrificed his son and that his son sacrificed his life on the cross for you, for me. Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice for us all in that he died and his blood became the propitiation for our sins, okay? That speaks of sacrifice. I'm going to open my New Testament tonight and invite you to do the same and just notice a few passages that you'll see on the PowerPoint to kind of help us develop this thought a little bit in terms of sacrifice. From John 3.16, we move over to 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. And Paul speaks of this same kind of sacrifice that John 3.16 touches on. And Paul develops it in just a slightly different way. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Now the word sacrifice isn't used there. But the idea is prominent. Jesus was rich, but he became poor. Does that sound like sacrifice to you? It does me. He gave it up for us. That's sacrifice. So that we might become rich through what he has done. So we'll benefit from the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus called certain men to be his disciples and later on his apostles. And these certain men, women too for that matter, not, not apostles, but as far as disciples go, there were sacrifices involved for all of them. But in Mark chapter 10, in verses 28 through 30, Peter asks something about Sacrifice. In fact, he made a point to say, you know, we, we've left all and we've followed you. In other words, we've sacrificed everything and we've become your disciples. And Jesus answered and said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, there's no one who has sacrificed, that is, left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother, or wife, or children, or lands. For my sake and the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now, in this time, houses and brothers, sisters and mothers, children and lands, with persecutions, however, and in the age to come, eternal life. These people knew something about sacrifice, and Jesus said, it's okay, it's all, it'll all be worth it, because you'll get back more than you ever imagined. I'm sure that's true for any of us who sacrifice anything 
far as the Lord is concerned. But these people knew something about sacrifice. Again, you don't see the word there, do you? But you do see the concept of it. It jumps out at you. In Hebrews chapter 13, jumping over, here's a different kind of sacrifice. And in Hebrews 13, verses 15, 16, here's a sacrifice that marks what you do as Christians, what we all do. We do this every time we come together, every time we assemble, every time we worship. This is what we do. And it involves sacrifice. Here it is, Hebrews 13, 15, beginning, Therefore let him, or by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Pause for just a moment. Seems to me that when we offer our hymns of praise to God, that's exactly what we're doing. We're offering the sacrifice of our lips in praise to Him. It's not just a tradition, not just something we do. It's a sacrifice of praise to God. And if I can look at it that way, then it elevates my appreciation of what we do when we sing, when we praise, when we glorify God. There's sacrifice involved in that, and it's of praise. But then in the next verse, 16, but do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So when we help one another and we give, that's a sacrifice. And God is pleased with that. You see how the New Testament uses the word sacrifice? It takes it away from the idea of animal offerings in terms of an old religion, brings the idea forward, and uses sacrifice in ways that mean we're, that we give something to God. We give of ourselves to God. We do that when we worship. And Hebrews 13 touches on that. In a related matter, over here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, Christianity is all about sacrifice. You sacrifice yourself to God. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, in familiar terms, you, Peter says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, not animal, spiritual, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is very similar to Romans 12 and verse 1, that we're to offer to God our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, to God, which is our reasonable service. That's Romans 12 and verse 1. But you notice how similar these two verses are. And they speak of the same concept, of sacrifice, spiritual. That's what we do. That's why we're here. Our worship, our lives as Christians involves this type of thing. And then, in Philippians, a couple of verses here that stand out for me. In Philippians 2, 17, Paul writes, Yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Paul gave himself as a sacrifice, basically, to the church at Philippi. And he was happy for it. the sacrifice and the service of your faith. And then while we're here in Philippians, one final thought, chapter 4, in verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full 
and have received from Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. I think the context of that would show that the financial assistance that the church at Philippi gave to Paul so that he could preach the gospel there and other places was a sacrifice. He depicted it as a sweet-smelling aroma that wafts up to God, well-pleasing to him, a sacrifice. We have to sacrifice in order for the gospel to go out. So as Dale Morris mentioned sacrifice this morning, and that stuck in my head just a little bit, and I thought, well, maybe it would be better for me to spend just a little bit of time tonight and contemplate the idea of sacrifice. Not solely because of tomorrow, but it doesn't hurt to bank off of that just a little bit because that is about sacrifice. And sacrifice, as far as we're concerned as Christians, does not end with those who gave their lives for this country. And to take it up to a higher level, sacrifice does not end with what God has done for us does not end with what the apostles gave up in order to follow Jesus. It does not end with what the pioneer gospel preachers of ages past have done and have given up and have laid down for us so that we might, as we oftentimes say, stand upon their shoulders. Yes, they sacrificed. And we wouldn't be here were it not for those sacrifices. But it doesn't end there. That's not all there is, in other words. There's more to the story. God has given all. Jesus has given all. The Holy Spirit has given us all. But there's more. As in Psalm 51, 7. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you will not despise. All right, that cuts to the quick. That gets to me. The sacrifices of God are how I am wounded in heart, a broken heart, contrite, humility, coming to him, realizing that I'm in sin. There's no way that that sin can be forgiven outside of the sacrifice that Jesus has made upon the cross. And I bring myself to it and I yield to it. Then and only then can I know the benefits of that sacrifice and enjoy it for myself. So tonight, I leave you not with merely the thought of Sacrifice and how much that demands of people, and sometimes it demands all. And of all, it demands something. But it ends with you giving yourself a living sacrifice back to God. You start at the cross. You start with the forgiveness of sins that Jesus offers. That comes through your response and obedience to the gospel. And then your faithful living and sacrifice as long as you live upon this earth. Sacrifice. Do we really know about sacrifice? Let's think about it tonight. And let's ponder this thought while we stand and sing to encourage you.